Welcome to the second day of the EuroConsult World Satellite Business Week. My name is Alexandra Jarkeanu, and I'm part of the marketing and events team at EuroConsult, and I'm delighted to be your host throughout today's session. Here on stage two, we will host today the Summit on Earth Observation Business, and we will focus on the developments of this dynamic and fast evolving sector. We have a great program lined for you today, uh, so I do invite you to spend the next up to five hours here with me on stage. At the same time, on stage one, you can tune in to see my colleagues at the Summit of Satellite Financing. And do not worry if you cannot attend both sessions at the same time. All of the sessions are being recorded as we speak, and we will be able to tune in and watch these at your own convenience later. We also invite you to make the most of our digital event platform to network, check out our sponsor booths, and arrange meetings with potential business partners. During our panel discussions, you will have the opportunity to ask your Q&A to the attendees and invited speakers and the moderators will address this at the end of each session. But first, let's start and kickstart the day of today. And I would like to invite EuroConsult CEO, Bacon Révillon, who is going to kickstart today's discussions by giving us an overview of the Earth observation business throughout the last year. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be with you uh, today for the start of our new uh, Summit on Earth Observation business that happens to be virtual this year. So I would first like to take the opportunity to thank Alexandra for her introduction, but also for all the effort she has, been, she has put over the summer period to organize this uh, program and, and contribute to the overall event. So. With no further ado, I would like to start with this first presentation of some of the uh, strategic dynamics that we see for the Earth observation business. So, just a word about EuroConsult. As many of you would know, but maybe not all of you, we are a leading international uh, strategic advisory company supporting decision makers around the world, and in particular, uh, those involved in the Earth observation business. So, as part of that, we have had our continuous research program over the years that supports our uh, dedicated consulting services. And obviously, we've been uh, organizing uh, executive events focused on this industry each year. And uh, we have conducted over the years uh, training activities. But as part of that, I shall stress today, uh, as part of our research, the brand new uh, digital platform services that we have uh, started over the summer. So. Progressively, it's a new platform where we'll migrate more and more of our research to bring to all of its users a clear uh, brand new experience. In the meantime, we just introduced as well a brand new training catalog where together with partners, we intend to offer the best in terms of, of training for both economic, strategic, but also technical aspects of uh, the space and as part of that earth observation activity to the benefit of users uh, and uh, stakeholders around the world. So that second chart, I will not comment much. If you want to have a views at uh, some of the activities we've been conducted, a few KPIs to look uh, what we have in the background, uh, happy to let you have a look later. So with no further ado and looking at what's happening and transforming the earth observation business. So first comment in this very particular year is uh, that the stream and transition that we have seen continues. But if you think also of the resilience and importance of this industry, you could look at the financing trend. So if you look at government budgets, it's a fact that government budgets and government commitment has remained very high this year. We talk about a $12 billion budget for civil and military uh, related Earth observation programs, and this we expect to continue in the coming years and through this crisis. Uh, as another example of that government commitment, European Union has uh, confirmed a willingness to proceed with a new Copernicus budget allocation, and that should represent a multi-billion effort over the coming years that will continue to contribute uh, to the shaping of the European Earth observation industry. Uh, new fundraising, clearly, we'll see that after. Uh, maybe a slowdown, but some have been announced, not negligible. So at least two uh, 
uh, company ISI and GHGSAT announced a significant fundraising in just uh, the last three months. So besides that, policy and regulation. Earth observation is about the data business. So obviously, the services of tomorrow, the ability of companies to transform data collection into actionable services will continue to depend on the regulatory framework that is being organized. And here I would say most governments around the world continue to try to work on more supportive um, uh, sorry, uh, regulations, still obviously respecting and taking consideration to all security issues, data protection, data ownership that you could think of. But this being said, a great example is the change of regulations, the new announcements by the Department of Commerce in the US that have provided some uh, release on uh, preceding rules as same as some of the programs that you could look at. And in terms of innovations and offerings, we could see on the one side, uh, brand new offers or types of services being offered and data captured in the market, but at the same time, continuous investment in some uh, cloud uh, related partnerships. So, Getting into the details and thinking of COVID-19 impact, uh, what it's done, what it might do. So on the one side, and it's been visible, I would say globally, Earth observation is a critical tool to monitor human activities around the world. And because of its nature flying above the sky, it could even be useful to compensate some for some activities that could not take place on the ground, either due to limitations on the use of UAVs, or deployment of uh, ground sensors or surveys, etc. So clearly, many events have proven uh, the use of Earth observation in that context. And at the same time, we've seen accelerated interest and development around the platform as a service, subscription models being developed. And these are the ones directly promoted by uh, satellite operators or service companies, but the one requested and developed for uh, government agencies typically who want to benefit from internal capabilities. So this being said, clearly there are also a number of negative aspects. Um, and the first one that I should mention is a global economic uncertainty and the fact that there could still be long lasting effects on the ability of certain customers to commit and spend in a variety of services that could include a uh, subservation among them. And uh, as well, Clearly, just because of the lockdowns that many countries have experienced on the impact on operations of various public or private stakeholders, we could see a shift in decision making by a variety of organizations. And this could for part weight on the revenues of this year for certain companies. And part of that growth could be uh, delayed to at least 2021 or after. If we think of uh, the next generation of assets and the startup companies that has been a clear ongoing trend in the last few years. So first, if you look up to 2019, uh, last year was another record year in terms of fundraising. We talk about close to uh, $1 billion. And as you could see, it's not just an increase in volume, but it's also an increase in the diversity of stakeholders benefiting from that fundraising trend. So you could see a diversity in terms of the type of constellation or assets, but also not visible on the chart is a diversity in the region of origins of the companies that have benefited from fundraising. So while the US obviously remain a central point, we have seen more fundraising for European or Asian based companies in the last two years. And as well, the stakeholders investing include obviously financial, uh, venture capital firms, but also a number of strategic investors coming from the industry itself, or also certain governments to have organized um, some form of investment capabilities in order to support startup companies and occasionally to support the development of national or regional champions. So as part of that, I think one very important event or trend has been the ability of a number of companies to pass a B round and we talk about companies that uh, have raised somewhere between 50 to 150 or even 200 million dollars. So with that kind of fundraising, it puts them in a position to work on the first uh, generation of platforms. If you think of satellite operators or obviously 
on a lot of uh, development for uh, AI and software focused companies. So clearly out of that, you could see how some companies have passed the cut and how they will be in a position to have at least the first generation of uh, assets in the sky or service offering. Uh, as well, and understanding that you could see a slowdown in the ability to raise funds for certain companies, this could create a gap with companies already well funded and the ones that are not. And I think this and next year will be uh, pretty critical in terms of the ability of different project orders uh, to make it uh, to orbit, shall I say. So investment, ability to deploy assets, obviously uh, will uh, resonate in the number of satellites in orbit, in the number of sensors available and data collected ultimately to deliver services. So currently uh, this year we talk about already over 350 satellites in orbit collecting data, delivering them. But if you think of uh, maybe three, four years out, you're talking about more than 600 satellites that should be in the sky and collect an increasing diversity of data. Because as you could see, while optical will still be the, represent the largest part, uh, some more high space spectral uh, sensors and payload, potentially hosted or, or primary payloads, but also uh, gas emission monitoring, uh, radar capability will get transformed and even some uh, new mid-ocean uh, assets should be deployed. So altogether, this will represent a much larger offer with still a majority of those satellites belonging to a more limited set of organizations, obviously, as they will be part of constellations, and many of them being uh, small, and I would say smaller satellites than uh, the preceding uh, average, shall I say. So those satellites are not just satellites in numbers, uh, for sure, they will represent an increasing diversity of capabilities. And we talk here about um, collecting information on all points of Earth every day or every week uh, to have a complete remap remapping capability to satellite being uh, or constellations being a in a position to track uh, points, uh, information every day, but on discrete points around the Earth. So obviously they will address some form of different clients uh, several assets that I shall get combined together to produce a complete new experience to clients. But clearly those two to three years could be pretty disruptive in terms of the uh, capability and, and the data, let's say, that you can work with. Uh, obviously the data is just, well, just is the start of the story, but there it goes all together through the data collection the ability to do more and more automated uh, data treatment, but then analytics and to make them available to the clients around the world. And here I would say for sure satellite players would compete one against the other, but I would say even more than that, uh, the stake for the industry would be to capture markets that are already occupied by other types of capabilities, such as IEO um, uh, imagery or uh, even ground uh, segment surveys and so forth. So really enlarging the markets to ones that they could not penetrate before, but as well having the ability to create and work with clients to open complete new uh, requirements and, and serve them. So if we look into the details, the first step will be about data collection. And here we see a clear increasing diversity, some of the latest uh, important news have certainly been the announcement of uh, Microsoft of its my, uh, Microsoft Azure Orbital uh, new service offering and capability and installation of ground segment uh, next to its uh, data centers. But across the board, we've seen a larger number of uh, models and partnerships being to put together by various organizations. So at the end of the day, it will enable to collect data more quickly to distribute them more efficiently and for operators of systems to have the ability to go for relatively low cost ground segment solution and optimize their capex and ultimately uh, optimize the cost of the service. So after the data collection, what is really uh, growing and developing at a rapid pace is the platform as a service that I already mentioned. So here it's obviously a lot about partnerships and again, uh, GAFAM companies have been working with stakeholders in order to make the information available. 
outside of, I would say, what has been developed uh, primarily by US-based organizations working with parties around the world. You could find a relatively comparable approach promoted by at least uh, China with stakeholders such as uh, Tencent taking positions. And in Europe, uh, you could take into consideration the DIAS platforms that have been supported by the European Union in order to optimize or support uh, data collection and transfer from the Copernicus program in particular. So this being said, those platforms are developing fastly. We can't say that they are necessarily yet completely mature. They will certainly continue to change in the next two to three years, as well as the pricing mechanisms and how easy their access and use shall be for uh, the well, combination of partners, value-added service providers, but also a number of uh, direct end user clients. So if we think of that distribution, I would say an organization of the market, uh, the platform as a service will be important, but we believe that it will certainly not reduce the importance of having a number of or either vertically specialized partners or having a local partners for both data distribution and uh, service supply to the end users. So as part of that, we still believe that the ecosystem of companies could continue to increase or potentially remain at least stable if we see some consolidation taking place among service companies to manage the complexity of the new services. But clearly there, a large diversity of distribution agreements will remain key for the industry to grow. In parallel to that, if we look at what used to be a relatively stable organization where clearly historical leaders were uh, representing the largest part on the data side and an important part on the value-added service side with a lot more fragmentation with very uh, small companies. We could see that ecosystem changing in the next two to three years. Would it be from uh, the impact of the new startup companies owning satellite constellations to a potential uh, movement in the value-added service component with a position taken by uh, the large uh, uh, internet or let's say online groups and technology groups and otherwise potential form of uh, consolidation in the market. But when we think of our forecast, in terms of commercial EO data sales, we still see that as a gross market, clearly primarily driven by uh, defense and intelligence agencies that should continue to invest and acquire additional capabilities from uh, the various uh, systems and so that will be available in the coming years. So part of that growth will be limited by price pressure, but we continue to see value in the data acquisition and direct access by value stakeholders. But in the meantime, clearly the largest part of the revenue growth will come from value added services, where we see that market increasing to approximately $4 billion by 2024. Uh, it's not worth it that we've revised our modeling to have likely uh, what I would call a stricter definition of VAS in our updated modeling for this year, which would result in relatively lower revenue as a starting point, but clearly the growth dynamics remain there. And we consider that as kind of our baseline growth uh, scenario where upside could exist, but on the back of a number of, of conditions to apply an ability to create some new uh, markets. So at the end of the day, that growth will result not just from one uh, condition or a key condition, I would say, but from a combination of them, that will continue to be uh, the creation of awareness, education, working deeply with a number of players across the verticals to uh, uh, further promote uh, the use of satellites derived solutions and where it's primarily about data and what it means to the clients, automation of the processes to reduce cost, optimize delivery and again, uh, provide more and more plug and play services. Acquisition platforms will be more numerous, more sensors, more ground options to capture and offer very low latency uh, services. Vertical integration, we clearly see a trend. There could be some shifts, but relationship between manufacturing, constellation ownership, but then as well, the level of platform development and service partnership. Lower cost base, uh, clearly, uh, Clients will be willing to consume a lot more data and analytics, but at the expense of a continuous effort on the optimization of 
uh, the price offering and let's say value creation through your products. And at the end of the day, new sales model, we talk here about subscriptions that could be a new reference case in the future, but also revenue share, other forms of partnerships that will all together contribute to uh, the new growth phase that we can anticipate and its potential acceleration. Um, that's here for this presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And with no further ado, I would like to invite uh, the speakers of the association I'm about to moderate to join me, uh, namely uh, Francois Lombard, Tony Frazier, and uh, Paolo Minciaki. Thank you very much. And uh, let's start with our new session.